Hey Last Looks crew, this conversation with hair and makeup designer Graham Johnston signals the crucial role of attitude within the makeup crew. Being a team player, exhibiting the right spirit and going that extra mile are all deeply valued by this seasoned professional. Now, I met Graham on a film in Prague. I came onto the project as a personal for the lead and Graham was the hair and makeup designer for the entire film. Now, when I found out who was doing the project, I of course looked up his IMDb and my jaw dropped. How had I not heard of this man? And also, holy shit, that is an impressive resume. And with that, I was excited to be working with him. And not only has he worked on incredible films, he is also a top-notch human being. Now, I have started the intense mission to interview all five nominated teams for the Last Looks podcast Oscars special for 2024. So if you happen to be one of those people and you are listening, check your inbox, check your spam. And if you don't see anything, please reach out so we can set up a time for you and your nominated team. And remember, this weekend we have our live Q&A with hair and makeup designer Flora Moody. Flora has worked on Star Wars films, she's been to Middle Earth a couple of times, and has also visited the world of The Matrix. I have no doubt you are curious to know more, so grab your tickets, submit your questions, and use the discount code LASTLOOKSPOD, or one word, LASTLOOKSPOD, for your 40% discount, which is pretty sweet. Link is in the show notes, or you can always find anything Last Looks related on our website, last-looks.com. On the website, you can also access past Q&As, all filled with so much sound advice, tips and tricks, and of course, great stories. My name is Jamie Lee, a film hairstylist living in LA, and this is the Last Looks podcast a show where I catch up with hairstylists and makeup artists working in the film and television industries around the world. And today, we're catching up with hair and makeup designer, Graham Johnston. On with the show. And now, a word from our sponsor. John Blake's Wigs and Facial Hair has been providing the highest quality wigs and facial hair to the film, television, and live theater industries for 15 years. Our human hair wigs are low density and hand tied on Swiss lace to give the most realistic and natural appearance that is undetectable in HD and 4K content. This small, family-owned company has grown to fill a vital role to artists across the globe. We provide an unparalleled customer service experience that is rare in today's retail market. Our facial hair pieces come in 17 different styles and colors that are designed to precisely mimic natural growth and coloring patterns. They are made from blending human and yak hair in order to create the most realistic texture and appearance of men's facial hair growth. We are grateful to be celebrating 15 years of being an industry leader and a vital part of your artistry. And now, our feature presentation. Pictures up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, Graham. Hi, Jamie. Lovely to join you and very exciting to be part of it. Absolutely. Okay, so this is where our story begins. I want you to finish this sentence for me, okay? Okay, if I can. <laughs> <It's> like, <uh-oh. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Graham, and when he grew up, he wanted to be... Something to do with the movies and something to do with showbiz, because I always was attracted to it. Okay. So at any point, did you think, I'm going to be on stage or an actor? Yes, I did. I did sort of amateur dramatics. I went to drama classes and then was told in no uncertain terms by my father that I had absolutely no talent and was wasting my time. <laughs> oh, good on dad. Wow. <laughs> So that somewhat squashed my ambitions to be an actor. (laughs) And how old were you when he informed you of this? I think it was about 17 or something. Okay. I was like imagining a five-year-old Graham. No, 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 no. (laughs) 
My mother always wanted one of us to be a star, but she yeah. didn't do any showbiz mum things like take us to drama school, do mm. taste of additions. She just thought by some miracle one of us would be a star. But right. uh, yeah, so. so what happens at 17 when your dad said that to you? you obviously, <laughs> you must have taken it pretty seriously, what he said to you. No, I just thought, oh, well, maybe he's right. Maybe it's not for right. me. Uh, I was quite sanguine about it. And then I, I did know I wanted to do something artistic, but I'm not really a fine artist, but I did do a little bit of art at school. And then I had a kind of year or two out working in an antique business, mm. working front of house in the theatre. So sort of in the arts, involved with the arts to an extent. And then I headed off to university to do a degree. Do a degree in? In the history of design, which turned out to be a, a complete turkey, and uh, <laughs> I thought, what am I doing on this? And then yeah. blagged my way into Wimbledon Art School in London to do costume. So oh, okay. then I started to get into more of the craft of, yeah. you know, behind the camera. And when I was there, we did do some makeup for our displays, etc. Um, and in the summer, I worked at BBC Scotland as a dresser, you know, doing mm. the costumes, but working beside the makeup people. And I thought, oh, I like what they do. Yeah. That looks interesting. And I'd never really wanted to be a costume designer. I mean, everyone would just end up in navy and white if I was designing them. <laughs> because that's, that's all I ever wear. Keeping it safe. <laughs> keeping it safe, keeping it safe. And a friend was a makeup artist at the BBC at the time and said, oh, look, there's a training scheme coming up. They had them every so many years, like every two years. It depended... <laughs> It was all in-house in those days. It was all, everyone was in-house. So you were like, it was like part of, being part of a civil service almost. So when anyway, I managed to get a position as a trainee, I think mainly on the strength that I was a man, <laughs> because I think they wanted to up the numbers. Because the first kind of makeup and hair I really did was for the test to get into the BBC. So I don't know how I managed to blag my way into this. It then turned out I didn't realise highly sought after training course so maybe <laughs> I think all the, backwards <laughs> I know I think the naivety of youth was a big help in it yeah. I have to say you yeah. know and then I trained I trained at the BBC so that's when I started my hair and makeup because as many of your listeners may know in the UK we do hair and makeup we do the two yeah so how long does that training go for at the BBC they kind of start you at the bottom and work your way up right yes basically when you start you have a two-year apprenticeship first three months is intensive in London so you're all brought together and various lecturers come in teachers hairdressers etc then you're you were sent out to whichever post they thought you should go to. Now, I was living in London, I'd been in London, but I think being Scottish, they thought, hey, we're put into BBC Scotland. Right. So I then was had to make my way back to Scotland. I, Time. <laughs> I sipped home, basically. But in a way, it was quite fortuitous because although we were a very small department compared to London, there was maybe like, oh, I don't know, 10 of us, maybe 12. And in London, I think it was about 200. Right. We did do a lot of big dramas and we did some dramas that were for BBC London. They would go out as a, you know, a network drama. Mm. So I got a lot of experience quicker than many of my colleagues did in London because you were sort of thrown in at the deep end. I'm not always recommending it because, you know, later on I felt, gosh, I could have done this maybe having a, a broader experience with more experienced people. But on the other hand, it got you quite confident quite quickly because you had yeah. to just deal with leading actors and do it, even though you were like two years in training. <laughs> That's awesome. So when do you get to the point where you think, OK, time to move on from the BBC? Well, I was there about six years and yeah. then... I was called, well, it, it, it's too boring to tell and nobody would be interested, but I was a, called an acting designer, which was basically, I was on a, a, an assistant grading for everything, mm. including P, but I was allowed to design productions. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm designing network productions, but getting paid less than the, the costume dresser. I thought, this mm. doesn't really seem to work for me. The, what, the thing that really kind of put the sort of decision to leave was that we were all going to be made redundant in about two years' time. They were getting rid of all the in-house art department, costume, graphics, etc., and us included. 
And I just thought, oh, you know, Paul, it's time to go. So I just decided to just resign and leave and thought, right, what do I do now? Uh, you know, but I've never regretted it. I have to say uh, the first day I opened the curtains and the sun was shining, which is unusual in Scotland. I just thought I'm free. I'm master of my own destiny. And I yeah. was incredibly lucky. I got some work back at the BBC as a designer. Mm. And then a friend put me forward for a very small indie film that was coming to Scotland called Shadow Grief, with, directed by Danny Boyle. Yeah. And I was very fortunate to get that. But I think the first year I left freelance. So that was incredibly lucky. So many lucky breaks along the way, I have to say. Well, I mean, looking at your resume, I'd say it's more than lucky breaks, Graham. Well, I've had opportunities. <laughs> Let us see. I've, I've had, I've had lo- opportunities I've been able to take. So, so anyway, that got me started on the freelance world and also the freelance world of film. I dipped a little bit back into TV, uh, but then I kind of concentrated on doing films. But basically, I prefer the format of a film. Yeah. I, I'm not very keen on episodic. I'm not terribly keen on having various directors. Right. Because I like to know that's my director, that's my script. Now, I know scripts change, but you know basically that's the script. Not you've got six episodes and you've got no idea what's going to happen in episode four. But you've been asked to budget it and asked to plan it. You're going, I don't have a script. So I just decided to pursue films and gradually built up a CV. And as the ball gets rolling, you get more work, more contacts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I know television tends to not be my jam just because of how long it also goes for. (laughs) Oh, that's what I mean. I I did one. I did one recently, just coming twenty twenty, coming mm. out of uh, the pandemic lockdown, and it was nine months. And I just thought, oh, it's just too much. And I wanted a full time job. I'd have one. I like being freelance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I mean, the the beauty of being freelance, and, and as I said earlier, to be master of my own destiny, yeah. it's a wonderful privilege. And a great luxury to be able to pick and choose to a certain extent what I do next. Mm. That at the BBC, you were just told, this is what you're doing, that's what you're doing, that's your shift. And I like to be able to guide my own ship, so to speak. Yeah, it's good that you had that experience. Absolutely. It kind of just confirmed. Yeah. Now, I'm not criticising whatsoever people for doing. I absolutely understand for many people, it's a big, long batch of work. People have commitments. People have wants more security. I completely get it. But for me, my position I, is not for me. It's too long. I don't really want to spend nine months on one project. And particularly, this it was like 10 episodes. Yeah. And you never knew what was coming next. And it was filming, prepping. They also wanted to do show and tales, which I just eventually just didn't do. Because I thought, well, I can't. I haven't got the staff. I haven't got the time. I can't be doing show and tales and filming and prepping. It always sounds like a lot whenever I hear about it. I don't know how they kind of keep up with what. I don't know. I don't know. I think people work really, really, I mean, really hard on TV. And particularly more so, I think, in the States, even yeah. than we do. It sounds like it's one of those things that you almost need two heads of department to be like, one's shooting an episode and the next one. Exactly. I think one, kind of. some do. I think some do. Not so sure about the big streamers, but I know that BBC dramas used to, like, long-running soaps or soap dramas, whatever they call themselves, mm. um, would have two teams, one filming, one prepping and kind of leapfrogging over each other, which I think is the only way really to do it. But even that, I think, oh, I don't want to be all coordinating all of that. It's too much, <laughs> too much, too much of that hard work. I just want to come and do makeup and hair. <laughs> yeah. But it's also that thing I find that, like, I want to do, well, try anyway, most of the time to do projects that I'm excited by. So I, with a film, you can read the entire script and know like, oh, I really like this. But with exactly. a television show, if you're just reading the first episode, I mean, it could go downhill very quickly. Yeah. Exactly. That's a, that's a very, <laughs> no, it's a very good way. It's a very good way to look at it, Jamie. You know, it is true. You don't know what's coming. It's like, and, or also, or you get a synopsis. Mm. You think, well, what does that mean? It could be anything. I don't know what the script's going to be like. Yeah, so I mean, that's why I, I, I said to my agent recently, I just said, 
Never say never, but in this instance, don't bother. Don't, don't yeah. bother putting. There's no point. Don't waste their time. Don't waste my time. I yeah. don't really want to read an episode of a six parter that I've got no intention of doing. That speaks to me in a year's time. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Who knows? <laughs> so you end up working with Danny Boyle again on train spotting. Yes, I did. So, uh, train spotting one. I didn't do yeah. train spotting two. Well, there's, I mean, it's a big gap in between. <laughs> it's a bit of a big gap. They probably, probably thought, they probably thought I passed on and died by now. <laughs> Is he still, he's still kicking around with that makeup <laughs> brush? Threatening people. Yeah, I did train spotting two, which was great. And then they were going off to the States to do. I can't remember what the film they did in the States. It didn't do terribly well. I think with you and again, I think it was a romance. And they didn't have enough reasons for me to go. And in the pecking yeah. order, I wasn't high enough up, really, to be ordained, important to take. And then they did come back for the beach. Oh, yeah. But I was offered the same day gladiator. Uh-huh. And I thought, oh, oh, decision time. And I thought... When am I ever going to be offered an epic like Gladiator with Ridley Scott? Yeah. I thought, I, I really, it was a no-brainer. You know, it was lovely to be asked back to do the beach, but mm. I, I have no regrets about that decision yeah. at all. When you guys were doing train spotting, did you did you have the feeling at any point that it was going to turn into what it did turn into? I mean, it was... No, I thought it would be an interesting... Well, it was quite a cult book, I have to say. I did try and read the book, but it was in Edinburgh vernacular. Now, I know I'm Scottish, but I'm not from Edinburgh, and I could not read the book. I couldn't understand the vernacular. I couldn't get it. I just wondered what the book was saying. Oh, shit. Well, that's saying something that even if you're Scottish, you can have (laughs) Oh, no. No, I thought it would be an exciting wee film, but, but then the thing was, I think they spent more on the publicity than they had in the the production right. so uh, at the time I mean, it's a long time ago now mm. but everywhere you look there was posters every every underground station every bus shelter every bill poster was everywhere they really went for it oh they really promoted it and I think the music soundtrack was fantastic I think it mm. just look if I knew how to gamble in what films would be success I'd be a multi-millionaire yeah. it just I know it just hit a vein of popularity at that time. It just took off incredibly. Um, yeah. It did take them, what, 25 years to make the second one? <laughs> <laughs> well, it I didn't mean... rush. It didn't rush. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny that they even bothered. But, I um... know. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about Gladiator. Like, what was what was that like? Was that at that point? I mean, you'd done a lot by then, but was that kind of? It was a big. It was a big jump. It was a yeah. big jump for me. It was a yeah. big, big jump. And I was actually employed as head of hair department yeah. because they were doing it in the split between the had a makeup artist, but then I saw the DOP Johnny Matheson. I had worked with him on a film with Ridley's son, Jake, called yeah. Plunkett and McLean. And for some reason he said, oh, you should meet this chap. You know, he's got, he's got, I don't, I, I don't want to blow my own trumpet. But he, he obviously did a good sale. Mm. I had to, I cancelled Ridley twice. I didn't really think it was maybe the best thing to do to cancel Ridley Scott. But I was in a really small little indie film. There's only me and one other person. And I just couldn't make the appointments. And I thought, well, I'm obliged to this film. I know it's Ridley Scott. Yeah. And it's not out of disrespect for him. But I thought, but it's disrespectful to them. It's like, oh, I've got bigger fish to fry. I thought, no, I have to be here because we had, oh, I can't remember with some sort of tricky makeup to do. And I thought, well, that's my first obligation. So I eventually made him. And I took to them very much. And I was very fortunate to be asked for it. The one thing I heard afterwards was, though, people say don't compare it to Ben Hur or don't mention Ben Hur. He doesn't want it to compare to that. What did I say at my interview? Oh, it's a bit like Ben Hur, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it sounds like your interview went all right, though, Graham. So. Well, obviously, obviously. So, so it was a huge. It was a huge step for me. It was much. Yeah, it was much bigger cast, much bigger extras, bigger department, etc. But people were very generous in spirit and help. And mm. yeah, well, I got there. I got there. It's it was hard fun. to leave behind the low budget, though. I have to say, from the point of view, we'd all these extras. So I was up in a 
a market in London buying hair accessories two for five pounds yeah. for the extras because I thought, yeah. oh, because I wasn't used to having big budgets, so I was still yeah. still doing it on the cheap. As they oh, say. Well, the production would have loved that. <laughs> well, I know. I may, I may, maybe I, maybe I should. Uh, I think I should go back to that. I'm, I'm still quite. I don't know if you know the Scottish word "canny," which means careful. I'm yeah. still quite careful with budgets. I have to say, it's old habits dies hard. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, though. I mean, it's good to if you don't need to spend excessive amounts of money, then why? Well, exactly. And also, I think it's good because if you're seen to not be a spendthrift, when you do actually say, look, guys, I suddenly need five bespoke wigs, it's going to cost 25000 mm. They listen to you. They don't just yeah. think, oh, he's away spending money again. Yeah. So it has its benefits. It has its benefits. I think sometimes my department are kind of thinking, please, could I have another powder puff? Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go back for a second too because I – Yeah, of course. I feel quite strongly about you sticking to your guns and saying I'm unavailable, you know, I'm on this Mm. project right now. Yes. Because it's almost you feel like saying, well, if I get the job and I'm on your production of Gladiator and someone wants to meet me, do you really want me to be ducking out and leaving leaving you? So it's just Um, come on, guys. Absolutely. You know, and I explained that to them because they kept saying, well, can't you get someone else to step in for you? I said, there's only two of us here. Yeah. I mean, we're understanding, but on the other hand, it's kind of, well, if you're not going to be understanding, do I want to work with you, yeah. you know? Yeah. There is a bit of that. I mean, I do find interviews, and I don't mean this arrogantly, but I do find interviews are two-way, and I'm sure you do to a certain extent. You meet people and you think, well, do I want to work with this person? Yeah. And there's been, the, there's been a few jobs over the years I've just thought, Absolutely no, no way am I wanting to work with that person. Yeah. And, you know, there was one job I didn't have any option. Times had been hard and I suddenly <laughs> got off. And I suddenly thought, well, I can't, I haven't worked for a year. I can't really say no. Mm. But I had my reservations and every reservation was correct. But yeah. I, I survived. And you know what, does you no know harm sometimes to just have to deal with people that you maybe normally would avoid. So it's all a learning experience. It really is. I mean, I mean, I know everyone says it, but it's so true. I've been doing it, oh, I'm not saying how many years, uh, but a long I time. I you are about to say a hundred. No, I've been doing that. <laughs> yes, when I, when I started, the cameraman cranked it by hand. <laughs> <laughs> and the director wore breeches and had a megaphone to direct with. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, Jim Lee, it feels like a hundred years, and other times it feels like you know I've only just started. But yeah, it's all a learning curve, and the whole the whole thing's a learning curve. Not just the craft, which I love, and I'm, mm. I've suddenly I do in the last year or so. I feel like this resurrection of love for my craft. I don't know what's happened. That's awesome. I just say I really, really. I mean, I, as I say, yesterday I did. It, I did it as a favour for the friend here in Germany. I basically went and did the wig. In fact, I did the artist because I had done it the day before because she couldn't do it. Mm. But she's not used to wigs, and I said, "Look, I'll come and do it." And she said, "Well, they're not." I said, "Look." I do it because I was and I enjoyed doing it, and it was a real challenge because it was such a terrible wink to try and make it do something, and I was determined to make it work. And uh, so, yeah, I kind of thought, you know, I, I do really enjoy my craft. I do enjoy it, and it's great to always be learning something new. And there's always a trick you learn on a job. Unfortunately, sometimes you finish a job and then you think, oh, if only I had done that, that would have been much better. Rather late in the day. I mean, that always, I know that happens to me when I watch my work back. I'm always just mm. like, oh. I, I know, but hindsight is an exact <laughs> science. It's always, the problem is that when you're in the middle of a job, there's so many other things you're juggling. You're juggling the schedule, you're juggling the staff, you're juggling the budget, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes you just haven't got the time to just step back and calmly look. You just have to get it done. So I do understand what you're saying. Even just the time and the moment. Like it's saying, yes. we're losing light. Like oh, got to the famous last words. Of, put yeah. them in front of camera, however the fuck they look, and you're just like, oh, God. Oh, no, or, oh, no time for check. Turn over. And you're thinking, 
Oh, I think the wing slipped back off the hand, but never mind. That'll be right. fine. Oh, we'll fix it in post. I mean, the unfortunate thing is now we can fix quite a lot in post now, which is quite good. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> the last film that I did that came out was Oppenheimer and that there is no fixing in post with Christopher Nolan. So uh, well, I was just what? like, oh, God. <laughs> well, a well done job. Very good. A round of applause from all those listening. I say to Jamie Lee, it was excellent. Then, love not a lovely period feel because it felt real that's I mean that's one of the things I like when things look real and they look I mean it looked period but it looked real and the people embodied it they didn't look as if like I've got a hairstyle in my head that I'm wearing and a period costume that I'm wearing I mean it is partly the the actor has to feel it as well I mean we can do the most wonderful job and if they don't Mm. embrace it yeah, you really, it's you know, you're not going to win, particularly, I don't think. No. So how do you approach character design and development and stuff when you when you start a job that's quite stylized? I tell you what, I find when I'm reading a script, mm. that suddenly images start to kind of pop into my head. It sounds a mm. bit pretentious, I know. But it is because there are some scripts I read and I just think, I don't see anything here. I don't see any of these characters. I really... Nothing's coming to me visually. Mm. So that's initially how I do it. Then obviously you have the interview and you get a handle on what they want. Mm. I mean, I do know people go with reference pictures and mood boards for interviews. I never do because Mm. I think, well, I don't know what they want. They might want something completely different than I think. Yeah, I've always wondered about that because I've had people Mm. ask me if I get books and things ready for interviews. And I'm like, well, a lot of the time I haven't even read the script at that point. But even if I have... I'm there to facilitate what they're wanting, so... But, I need well, exactly, to... exactly. I mean, if they ask you for yeah. an opinion, what do you feel? <clears throat> I don't know, like, well, it's period, are you very... Do you want to... Do you feel it should be a strict period? Mm. But it is, it is their vision, and usually it's the director's vision. So, as you mm. say, we're there to facilitate it, to create it. Mm. I may have an opinion. I may want to put it forward once I've got my foot in the door, once yeah. I've got the job. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't agree with... No, I don't agree with it. But I do know someone who went with all this research, this is years mm. ago, and pictures, and the director looked and went, well, this is nothing like we want. And right. you thought, well, you can sort of queer your pitch before you've even started. Mm. And it, we are, I mean, technically we are a service department, so we're there to service. So I'm sure you've had to do things. I've had to do things. I think that looks hideous, but it's what they want. Oh, yeah. And that's, you know, so, yeah. It quietly yeah, comes out of my mouth as I'm walking away. Okay. You like exactly, it. exactly. Are you, <laughs> that's all I'm, that matters. <laughs> I know. And, and sometimes my face isn't very good at hiding what I'm thinking. So yeah. I've had someone say, oh, do you not think that's a good idea then? I'm like that. Mm, well, not really. <laughs> Far be it from me to say. I made one interview with this and they said, and what do you think of the script? And I went, well, I thought it was very amusing. I said, but quite frankly, would you change it if I had any input about it? (laughs) I mean, I was like that. I said, I do hear in me. (laughs) It's like, give us a break. I know. Is it like I'm not going to sit here and give you a review on your script? Like, yeah, I know you feel the same. I know you feel the same. I am here as the makeup designer, not just the script <laughs> script supervisor or editor. Am I? Do tell me. Do tell. Do let me know. I feel like saying you wouldn't want me to be directing it. I'd be like a wide close up. Oh, that sounds finished. Oh, it's eleven o'clock. Lovely. That sounds done for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put Graham in charge. Nothing will get done. Don't put me in charge. No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So, looking back, I mean, I just, I would, uh, I have to mention that you worked on Spice World. Um, I have to oh, please. Mention Graham. <laughs> I am very proud of it. I, do you know? Do you know? It's one of the films. And recently I was working with someone and they were like, oh, you've done that, you've done, oh, yeah. I mean, it was things like, you know, The Revenant, Gladiator. They were asking me, I wasn't listing my resume to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they suddenly went, you did Spice, the movie. Honestly, they were so hyperventilating, so excited. (laughs) It was a P or something in a production. They were so impressed. I'd actually (laughs) done that. I was like, yeah, it was, it was actually such good fun. It was really fun to do. They called me Old Spice, which, as you know, <laughs> as you know, is also an aftershave that your dad yes, used to yes. wear. My dad used to wear it. It's very old-fashioned. 
But also, I mean, they were only, they were like 22 at the time or something. I mean, I think I wasn't that ancient at the time either, but it was a wee bit older than them. But they were fun, and they were fun. They had their own hair and makeup people, or right. one of each. But Far it was funny out. though because. That's a situation. <laughs> Uh, and I was doing everybody else, you know, sort yeah. of Roger Moore and Bob Hodge, all these people coming in. And it was all yeah. like, oh, my children or my grandchildren said I had to do it, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was, it was such fun. And I have to say those girls worked incredibly hard because at the end of filming, like a normal filming day, there was a huge, I don't know what you call them, those enormous lorries that was a mobile recording studio because they were recording their second album. Oh and they then God. went and recorded till about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And then came back in the next morning. Far out. So they were they were very sweet, actually. They were very sweet. They were very nice. It was quite funny, though, because we were doing a kind of pastiche of historical characters. They didn't have a clue who anybody was. Like, Who's that Jackie O'Bird? Who's she? Etc. <laughs> I was at that very sweet girls, but maybe not terribly well educated. <laughs> I thought, I thought, and they've not come straight from a Swiss finishing school, I think, you know. <laughs> oh my God. Well, that's why it was so much fun. <laughs> I know, exactly, exactly. But it was a huge success. It was a huge, I mean, it was done on the cheap, of course. It was done really quickly. It was grab their fame while we can. But it was, it was great. And it's so funny, as I say. It's still one of the films that quite often people are the most impressed by. You know, well, I mean, really... the Spice Girls were massive. I know, massive. I know. And it's lovely to be, I mean, I've been very fortunate to have been part of kind of quite iconic films, unfortunately now of the last century. <laughs> and pe- ones that people remember, you know. I have a friend who's won quite a lot of awards, much more than I have. And I have won any awards. I think the only last award I had was for my cycling proficiency at primary school. Yeah. And they've got quite a, they've got, you know, an Emmy. I think they've got an Emmy. I think they've got a BAFTA. Do they have an Oscar? No, they were Oscar nominated. But it says the films he mentions to the people nobody's heard of. Oh, do you know that film? Yeah, you know that I mean, uh, for, for those listening, honestly, you check out Graham's IMDb and your jaw will be dropping. It's just, it, it blows my mind, dude. Oh, it's, it's just, not. It's not. No, it just, is. It is. It's just like Gladiator, Bridget Jones's Diary, Spy Game, About a Boy. It's just like, it just keeps going and going and going. Love, actually. I mean, who? Oh, my God. Well, there's another one that we were doing. I thought, oh, it's, it's quite a nice wee film. <laughs> it's quite a nice wee film. <laughs> it again has become this huge... I mean, I'm it's only, a, as you know, a very small cog in the wheel. I've just been fortunate to be in things that are, if not iconic, but are just in people's mind that they remember, they watch again. I mean, I don't know about in the States, certainly in the UK... Love Actually has become a kind of the Christmas film to watch. Oh, I think lot- internationally it's very oh. popular, Graham. Yeah. I don't absolutely. know what the name is. I don't know what the name is here in Germany. They always have just funny names for things, films. Yeah. Like Bridget Jones was My Diary of Chocolate or something. It was like, what? <laughs> what? Oh, I know. They're, they're, they're funny nation, a funny nation. <laughs> I mean, like I, I turned to my husband last night to say that I was talking to you today and mm. I was just like, he did Children of Men and he was instantly impressed by you because it's just oh. like, one of his favourite films. He loves it. He's oh, like, oh, I'm God, really God. pleased. I'm really pleased. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm really pleased he enjoyed it. It, it didn't do terribly well when it came out. I think it's become a bit of a, a classic Bit of Very a cult film. It's actually from a short story. So that yeah. might have been the problem as well. It was a bit, you know, making a short story into full length doesn't mm. always work. But I thought it was good. I mean, it was it was very enjoyable. The director was a bit intense, but it was fine. I won't go there. It's that's the priest confessional. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's a pretty intense film, so I guess it was it's quite an intense in film. It. Yeah, but anyway, again, it was a real challenge for the looks, etc. I mean, he he had quite specific ideas what he wanted, so I had to sort of come up with what was required, etc. Yeah. I remember I remember I remember sitting in my apartment in London at the time mm. um spaghetti uh, spaghetti sized uh, dreads, having to YouTube it to try and find how to do it on this wig that wasn't a dreaded wig, sort of four o'clock in the morning to then take it in for approval. I thought, oh, Did but we've all been there. I'm sure on your fingers? You, oh, God. I'm sure you've been there. You start to think, oh, I've got to get this done. I've just got no choice yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, anyway. But I, I have to ask, and I can't believe oh. I didn't ask you this when we worked together, but The Revenant, did you do that entire film? I did the whole film. Well, I, I stepped in. 
I took over from somebody after okay. about a week. I think there's been some issues. Well, and I came in and we kind of reshot the big, big opening sequence, or one of the big right. opening sequences. Um, but yeah, no, I did the entire thing and I did the... The problem was that this, the Chinooks, which are warm winds in Canada, came into the Rockies early. Yeah. And so all the snow was melting. And at one point they were trucking it down from higher up and eventually they had to abandon it. And then we reshot the very end. And where was it? The tip of Argentina. I can't remember the region, but it's quite a few months later and a little bit yeah. in LA. I think, Graham, I have to say is probably, I mean, I know for me, when I was watching that film, I was just like, no, 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 never. There's no way I could do that movie. Like, just. <laughs> oh, what with the weather? Well, no, just the whole film. You know, sometimes you watch something and you're just Ooh. like, you put yourself in the position of being on set in that environment and you're like, no. But the thing was, we weren't really on set. We really weren't allowed on set, which was quite interesting. We did them. Now, in fairness, Shan and her prosthetics lovely guy did Leonardo, but I was doing, I was in charge of everyone else's makeup. Uh, Not the hair. At one point, wanted me to take over the hair, but I thought, oh, no, I'm not doing the hair as well. Mm -hmm. I thought, I don't want to push someone out of a job. Yeah. But we would get them ready and they would rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And then there was this magic light at four in the afternoon that they wanted to use for filming and Mm. if we were required they would ask us right so it was quite an unusual situation i mean you would like if the boys came back you'd sneakily try and check them but no we were persona non grata on set right Um, yeah i listened to an interview with the director and he was explaining that it was the locations were so far away from your staying so that there was like a couple of hours of travel and then everyone would go through the works and then they would rehearse 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 and they have to mm. wait for that perfect light yeah and then they'd shoot and then the light would be gone so they everything would be finished up so i think when you break it down like that it sounds a lot more doable but while you're yeah. watching the film you're just like <laughs> oh i know you're thinking oh my yeah. goodness so i mean quite often i was tucked up nice and cozy in a big makeup truck not outstanding in the freezing cold those poor boys though those actors i mean yeah. they had animal skins on yeah with you know they, they what we were all there and sort of you know i don't want to do advertising but that famous brand uh-huh. though we're all standing that and big ugg boots etc etc yeah they're in sort of skimpy trapper clothes. I mean, right. they really went through the mill. So often when they looked freezing, they were. They were. <laughs> mm. yeah. You could really feel it. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, with all the jobs that you have done, what would have to be kind of three favourite standouts? Three favourite standouts. They're hard over such a long career. <laughs> I tell on. you... I loved doing Plunkett and McLean, again, which was Jake Scott, Ridley Scott's one and only directorial films. Yeah. I think he he got his fingers burnt afterwards, I think. I think they were out to guess at the critics, actually. It was very unfair. Mm. I loved doing that film. And it it has become a bit of a cult film, I believe. It's quite popular, yeah. I mean, you obviously maybe have not heard of it, but it's Highwaymen in the 18th century. It's kind of almost like a big... It's almost like a sort of extended pop video with right. Robert Carlyle and, oh my goodness, I'm so bad with names. Anyway, it, it was very stylistic. Me, I'm not saying it was ahead of its time, but it was 18th century, but we had somebody with a pierced eyebrow. I had heart-shaped pink wigs for the ladies, you know, of the 18th century. Mm. It was just really good fun to do. It was You really allowed your imagination to just... Not run wild. It was one foot in the 18th century and the, the other whatever you fancied it. The only problem was I was out in Prague and this was like, when was this? It was only like nine years after the Velvet Revolution. So it was only nine years after communism had failed wow, or okay. changed. Yeah. And I would on my own, I, I was young, I mean, I was young then. I mean, I would never go anywhere without one person of my crew with me. And I had a lot of very lovely but very set in their ways Czech makeup and hair people who had come from the old Barendorf studio, which had been communist run. Yeah. And were kind of horrified going, but that's not 18th century and that's not 18th century. And did, right. did, did, did. they just could And I eventually just had to sit them down and say, look, I understand it. 
I guess it, but yeah. this is what the director wants. So please just go with the flow. You know, no one's going to have a go at you. This yeah. is the look of the film. This is, and maybe, maybe <laughs> I didn't have, did I have so many? Maybe I didn't have so many mood boards as I would now, maybe. Uh, yeah. And also it's pre, this, what, is it pre the internet? I think it was pre the internet. Yeah, it probably would be. I mean, now you can bring up a million images at mm. the, t- you know, the touch of a button, or not even the touch of a button, touch of a screen, I should say. So that's one. So I rambled on a bit. It's just one I really love. I mean, I still think it's a shame it didn't do better. Not so much, it's not as if I'm in points. It's not as if it make me any money. But it's a shame I wish people had seen a bit more of it because I think it was underrated at the time. I have to well, say. it sounds amazing and I haven't seen it, so I'm going to have to watch it. Oh, it's now. worth a look. It's, it's a fun, yeah. it's like a romp. It's like a slightly tongue in cheek romp. And it's Liv Tyler's the leading lady when she's oh, like awesome. 19. So it is a long time ago. So that's one. I have to see Gladiator. I have to yeah. see Gladiator. And I'm trying to think. And the Spice movie. It was fun to do. Just so much what, fun. Yeah. Oh, no, what stands out? Gladiator. I would have to say The Revenant. Mm-hmm. It was a big challenge, and I came in last minute yeah. um, and had to kind of get it to, to, to where the director wanted. But it was a challenge, not just the locality of it, just mm. the look of it. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I think those would be the three. Plunkett McLean. Gladiator and the Revenant. But I've loved all the other jobs in between in various different ways. I mean, that's the great thing I love is the variety. Yeah. I mean, one interview I went to, the director went, oh, you've got a very eclectic, varied CV. Mm-hmm. And I said, yes, oh, let's deliver it. That's what I like. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think sometimes it's stopped me being approached for work because sometimes it's a big period thing. I think they think, oh, he doesn't really have enough period work on his resume oh, and I have done TV stuff etc yeah. but uh, I think sometimes it's too varied for some people they want someone who just does I don't know action films or just does glossy films or just does period films hey, I never thought about that mine's a bit all over the shop and it was interesting when someone actually voiced it so right so I like the variety. I know other people who are happier in certain genres. And each to their own. And again, for those listening out there who are at the beginning of their career, yeah. it's one thing to, to find what you're comfortable with. That's what I would advise anyway. Yeah. I like a variety. There are certain things I wouldn't touch with a barge pole, if that's an expression that Americans use. I use it, so I understand it. <laughs> yeah, so right there means you wouldn't touch it, you wouldn't touch it. In for your life, I, for for instance, lookalikes. I would not want to do a lookalikey, right? If you know what I mean by lookalikey, yeah. it's amazing what people do. It doesn't interest me one iota. I know them because I've done them. <laughs> oh right, no, I know. It just I I I, I was approached about Judy with Rennie Zellweger because I worked with Rennie a few times. Yeah, and I just and the way they were talking, I just went. If you want a doppelganger, like a complete mm-hmm. replica, I yeah. said, you've got the wrong man. It's not for me. Yeah. I said, I like a character. You know, it's, it's her embodying. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I got the job. I pulled out of it for the idiot. She's the I did say to the director. <laughs> I said, no one's going to think it is Judy Garland, you know. They do realise it is her playing Judy Garland. Yeah. Because he was going, oh, she had different teeth and... Or, and her eyebrows were all uh, arched and she you know, had been shaved, etc. I said, well, yes, but that's Judy and that's them. You're yeah. portraying the character. I mean, I thought what they ended up was great, but yeah. but not it's not a process I want to go through particularly. So no lookalikes in my CV, funnily <laughs> enough. <laughs> no lookalikes. I have never no referred look-alikes. to them like that. I like it. <laughs> uh, no lookalikes. No do lookalikes. No, I don't do lookalikes. I don't like them. <laughs> What else do I like? Something that might involve being in a trench for three months or something. <laughs> yeah. Many, many years ago, I got approached about this. was up in Scotland, a small Scottish film yeah. set in a coal mine for six weeks. Ooh. I just went, I, at that point, I said, I'm a bit more of a white jeans boy. I didn't think <laughs> down a coal mine for six weeks is for me. Thank you very much, oh but no thank God. you. Well, I, I mean, yeah, it's smart of you to figure that out. <laughs> Well, that's what, I, you know, that's what I'm saying to people starting off the career. Find what you're comfortable with, what yeah. your genre is. Yes, it's quite good sometimes to be thrown out of your comfort zone. But mm, if you can, aff- I think, well, if you can avoid it, why do it? You know, yeah, that's yeah. What, you know. But I mean, I'm a lot further along in my career. In fact, 
one could almost say at the tail end, at the end of my career. So I, I don't want to do things now or go to countries that I don't want to go to either. There are certain countries I won't film in because I don't agree with their regime or their political regime. And I just think I'm not going to go and aid and abet their economy because I don't approve of them. So yeah. very high and mighty moralistic am I. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and it's also you don't want to be away from home and be somewhere where you're miserable. Like, no, exactly, exactly. I mean, that's another point. I mean, you do it, I do it. You're away for months at a time. I think I was away most of last year and about half of this year. So for those out there who are thinking of a career in hair and makeup or hair and makeup or, or makeup, uh, do not think it's a nine-to-five job. No, it really isn't. <laughs> and it's, it, is, it is exciting, the travelling, but at the end of the day, you are working and you're on a film set or in a studio somewhere. Mm. Yeah, you do get days off. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, sometimes. But, but I think some too yeah. tired to do anything. <laughs> I know. I, well, I know exactly. I, I worked in Mexico City doing Man on Fire, gosh, years ago. Gosh, it must be mm. about 20 years ago. Yeah. I think on a Sunday quite often I would just sit in my hotel room with the curtain shut watching BBC News because it was only English-speaking channel just to hear English voices. <laughs> so I thought, oh, just calm, just calm. That's uh, like your meditation or something. A bit of me, yes. <laughs> other people meditate, other people do you. I watch BBC News, bit sad, but that's true. Um, yeah, I have a New Zealand radio station that I listen to as well. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. well, I can get, I love um, BBC Radio 4 and BBC 4 Extra, mm. and you can get them worldwide, which yeah. is great. So, yeah, it's a great, uh, I mean, yes, you can watch Netflix, but I have to say sometimes watching, after working in a movie all day, the last thing yeah. you want to do is watch another movie. I know yeah. that sounds kind of bad, but it's kind of like, it's a bit like work. Well, the radio is a different medium, so it's a, a bit of an escape from it. Absolutely. And Graham, when you're putting a team together, what are you what are you looking for in your crew? I'm looking for uh, people who are team players, right attitude. I take to them. I like them. I think they're fitting with the other department people. Talent to a certain extent, but talent can be taught when they're younger if they've got the flair. Mm. So it's not always that someone. If I had the choice between someone who was fantastic. Mm. but a complete pain and mm. tricky and difficult. And someone who was fairly, you know, was okay, mm. but was a team player and, and nothing was too much trouble, didn't annoy me, they'd get the job for definite. Yeah. For yeah. definite. Because, you know, it can be sorted out, the makeup in here, or they can learn. I mean, obviously they've got to have some, you're not taking people off the street. They, they come recommended or mm. you've met them. So that's very important is attitude. It really is. For me, it's one of the biggest things. I, yeah. I've got people over the years that have fallen by the wayside as far as my department because of their attitude. And I just think, look, we work really long hours. I like to be cheery at work. I'm not yeah. a miserable person. Mm -hmm. I don't want miserable people around me. And I don't want... And I had one instance where it came to my ears. It was less less aware people were that they could report people being bullies, etc. But I then found out that someone was being bullied oh. to that while we were away in location and being left out. And I was so annoyed about it. Yeah. Because that's not on. If I find that's going on in the department, it really yeah. isn't. I don't bully people. I try and embrace everyone's, especially when you're refilming, we all get on each other's nerves. You know, it's difficult. It's very like a pressure cooker. It's very intense. But you have to give and take and you have to look after each other as a department, I think, yeah. particularly when you're away abroad filming. So you don't Absolutely. exclude someone from coming out for dinner because, oh, they're not your cup of tea. You don't care for them. Or, I mean, it was a shame for this girl and then ridiculing their clothes. This I heard after the event. I was furious about it. What is this, high school? <laughs> well, that's not exactly, exactly, Julie. High school. You know, oh, that, you're wow. grown, you know, you're grown women behave like grown people, grown <laughs> women. You know. Shocking. So yeah, that, I don't know if that went away from the point, but, but obviously a skill set as well. I mean, sometimes I bring, because we do hair and makeup, you, I like doing hair and makeup. But not everyone is good at hair and makeup. Yeah. And sometimes you're getting, bringing in someone because their skill is more hair. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're bringing people because the skill is more makeup. Yeah. And you're maybe, although I run a department as hair and makeup, I do sometimes divide the work. 
and do like that person do the person say it, that person do their makeup. So yeah. it's not absolutely, oh, we do hair and makeup. And I don't always do either because sometimes I think, no, that's going to be too, <clears throat> I'm going to be pulled from pillar to post. It's too much for me to do the hair and the makeup or maybe do yeah. the makeup. Somebody else yeah. can do the hair. Yeah. And to be honest, to those I, I, those who do hair and makeup are, are be spitting down the microphone at me, no doubt. Mm. When you're doing your hair and makeup, there are times when you focus too much on one and not on the other. I've yeah. been in and fiddled about with a, a wave in here and trying to hide the pen, making sure it's all beautiful, etc. And then suddenly realise, oh, the lipstick's missing. And then in a panic, mm. trying to put that on. So sometimes if it's a complex or not even complex, maybe quite a glamorous makeup in here. Yeah. It's sometimes better to have two people if you've got the luxury of doing it because obviously productions like people who do hair makeup because they can have the same amount of people. Well, they can have like, they think half the amount of people. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> it, 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 we maybe don't always do ourselves a favour, but you've, you've done hair makeup in the past. I mean, they do that in New Zealand, don't they? Yeah. They do the both, yeah. Yeah. And I was talking about it with the husband last night, I think it was actually, and thinking about when I first moved to the States and were watching makeup artists while I was just doing hair and mm. all the insane amount of products they had and the whole regimes and rigmaroles they went through, amazing. But at the same time, I was just like, there's no way, one, when you're doing both, that you would have time to do all of that. And also... Do or you be need able it? to yeah. have all of that product because <laughs> yeah. you just kind of work out. I don't know if it's true for everybody, but I think when you're doing both, you try to do it as efficiently as possible because you have to be worrying about both things. You have to be carrying your hair stuff and your makeup stuff with you. So you're going to try and make it as simple as possible, but to still get that same final look. I think that's very true. And I think also it's slightly sometimes people over-egging their teeth. It's like, oh, I'm only right. doing the makeup, so I better make it look as if I'm taking forever to do it and putting a million products on, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I had an instance where I was doing a, I was doing a major feature film, a major feature <laughs> film, and the director went, I don't want you to be insulted, but for the leading lady... We're bringing in my beauty makeup artist because she really knows what to do. And it's no comment on you. And I thought, well, not much, but fair enough. One nice mm. person for me to think about. Yeah. So cut to the quick. She came in, she did her, took forever. There was a million scented candles and crystals and chingy changy music and a thousand products sliding onto her face. And then I took over because, and she said, well, I'll tell you all that I did. And being a little bit nippy, I can admit, I didn't come here for a masterclass, thank you very much. Just you tell me what products and I'll do it. Um, mm. So I took the actress over. Now, she was Australian, so that was probably part of it. She was much more laid back. Mm. Uh, nice, nice young actress. And I said, well, hang on to your hats. I'm doing it my way. And she was done in about half the time. And she went, fantastic. She said, I couldn't stand sitting there for hours with all those products that put on my face. And she said, I look just as nice. I look just as good for camera. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not bumming my look. I'm not saying, oh, I'm so fantastic. But it was a pretty young woman with a nice little bit of glamorous makeup. It wasn't complicated. Yeah. So I think sometimes people overdo their case, like, oh, I'm using the makeup artist, so therefore I've got to put on as much makeup as I possibly can. Yeah. That's what I think, parents. Yeah. And I know not, I'm not saying that across the board that I've ever. No, no, not across the board. That, but no. it's just every now and again you're like, every, oh, wow, yeah. that's a oh, no. situation. Please, to makeup artists, <laughs> out, to makeup only artists out there, I wasn't criticizing you at all. No, me neither. <laughs> no, I think the odd person sort of overstates their case a little. And also we've all got our own. I mean, I'm, I'm very much less is more with everything, hair yeah. and makeup. And also I don't want to do makeup that take three hours. <laughs> After an hour and a half, I'm like, right, I'm ready, I'm road now. Just move yeah. on quickly. <laughs> I hate being asked as like, how can we speed this up in the morning? And I'm like, oh, my God. Like well, see, what you I, can't. Everything you can't. I do is trying to do it as quickly as and efficiently as humanly possible. When you're asking me this, it's just like, ah. I know. <laughs> But also, and very much more so with hair, you know what? You cut corners getting hair ready is not going to last the day. So you either take the time, do it properly, get it set, whatever you're doing, and then it can be maintained. 
You want me to cut corners? Uh, I fall to bits the minute go out or to say, there's your choice. Yeah. You know? I mean, I get now, well, that's the time it takes. I mean, I'm sort of, if somebody starts to give me hassle, I had one director, no, producer say to me, oh, the actress from Name, Nameless, oh, she looks very beautiful, but so she should, the time it takes. And I went, I beg your pardon? I said, she's in the time that I allot, which was like, I think hair and makeup was an hour or an hour and a quarter. Mm. I said, the fact she goes into her caravan and doesn't come out and the ages can't get her out for about 45 minutes is not my doing. So don't yeah. blame me that she's so long getting on to set. So you have to be careful. I remember years ago, a cameraman saying to me, the thing is, Graham, and this applies to all hair and makeup people, mm. the vast majority of your work is done out of sight, off of set, and nobody sees what you're doing. All they see is people come to set ready and you guys go in and do a last retouch. And they think, oh, that's dead easy. That's what they do. Right. Um, yeah. But, I mean, honestly, I, I, and another instance I remember years ago, I went on to say, and someone on the walkie-talkie went, oh, no, they're still in makeup. I went, well, no, they're not. I'm here. Hello. Um, yeah. You know, on the set. And I thought, oh, that's really nice. Stab you in the back. Throw makeup under the bus. <laughs> I know. I know what you for the say. It's, it's, we're always about, oh, they're still in here in makeup. And it's like, no, they're not. Yeah. That's why they don't like us having an open radio on the bus, because then we can hear what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> You can hear you getting crunched under the wheels of the bus. It's exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So has it been everything you thought it was going to be, the film industry? Has it been everything I thought it would be? Yes, I think to a certain extent it has been, because also I've always taken it with a slightly large pinch of salt. Mm-hmm. I've always been, I'm not saying cynical, but realistic. Yeah. I'm realistic about where I am in the pecking order. I'm realistic mm. about what my job entails. Mm. Being a Scot, I'm very pragmatic, so yeah. I just get on with it. I sometimes have to sit and think, actually, Graham, where would you have been if you hadn't gone into the film industry? Mm. I'd probably be sitting in the West End of Glasgow where I was brought up, doing whatever, Having not been and seen the places I've seen, mm. met the people I've met, yeah. had the experience I've had, and no small thing made the money I've made. Oh. Yeah. So it has been a fascinating and still continues to be yeah. really interesting. I mean, I just did three films back to back, which is so unlike me, because mm. I always say, oh, what a break. But each project came to me. We'd like you to do the job. They were all interesting jobs. I mean, the last one I did with you was great and Prague Ballerina. Yet to be released, everyone. I think next year is coming out. Yeah, I have no idea, uh, actually. <laughs> I think it's next year, possibly. But they were all really interesting, really nice projects. And it's yeah. like, well, who am I to say no? So, yes, it has been everything. I, I, I don't ever look back cynically. I have to say, I never look back and regret. And I turned one or two award-winning films away mm. and I've never regretted it. I thought I made my decision at the time. And that's another thing I would say to those starting off in your career. Don't look back, always look forward. I know everyone says that about everything in life, but it's so true. And if you don't yeah. get a job, I mean, yeah. I've occasionally, I've not got the second, I've not got the sequel to a film. Yeah. And I just thought, I'm not beating myself up. Why Why didn't they ask me? Why didn't they ask me? I just mm. think, well, they didn't have me, so that's fine. I did something else. Yeah. So never look back and regret things, I think. It's all part of life's rich tapestry. Another stitch <laughs> in life's rich tapestry. I mean, there's no yeah. film that I've looked back and thought, I mean, there's been one or two that were hard going, and I don't mean the makeup and the hair, the whole dynamics, the director, yeah. the production, you were like, no, really? Yeah. There was the odd time I've driven away thinking, that's it, I'm going to go and open a candy store somewhere and have a quiet <laughs> life. And there's days even still, you just think, why am I doing this? Why am I here at five in the morning waiting for an actor that's late? Uh, that's the thing that really annoys me. I have to see. I know. I-, I just wish that they would send me a text to let me know they were going to be late so I could also sleep in. I know. <laughs> I know. Or, oh, they've not got into their car. They've not into their chauffeur driven car. <laughs> yeah. You know. I mean, something you feel like saying. You actually need a spanking like a naughty child. Although I know you're, you're not allowed to spank children anymore. I know. Sorry about that. 
Um, but also, it's just like when they arrive, you have to be like, they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. And it's just like, that's okay, all good. And it's just like, actually, I feel like standing there with my hands on my hips like a well, mum going, what? really? You're Come lucky on. with some of them. You, you're lucky with some of them. You get a sorry. Yeah, it's true. And you're going to say, and how, would, how would you like it if you were sitting there in the makeup chair? And I wondered, and oh, hi, sorry, I'm a bit late. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Here I am. Nice to see you. I don't know. But that's part and parcel of it. It's, it. As you well know, it's just part and parcel of the job. Oh, absolutely. It really is. It really is. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very interesting life. And that's one thing I would, I think I mentioned it earlier, but I really would reiterate to people coming into the industry, mm. it is a vocation. It's not really a job. If all you want is a job, nine to five, yeah. set holidays, mm. see your partner, see your family, see your dog, your cat at the end of the day. If you, if you enjoy structure and stability. Uh, very well put, very well put. <laughs> you encapsulate it one word, structure. <laughs> I I, lo- I love the fact that I don't know what I'm doing next. Yeah. That, I know for a lot of people that insecurity is, I've always quite enjoyed it. People, you know, when you're on a film, people are like, oh, what's your next project? And more often than not, I'm going to do it. We'll just wait and see what happens. Yeah. I remember talking to you about this because it's uh, I am also the same. Because as soon as I have a job, it means I'm thinking about the job, which yes. in my mind thinks I'm yes. I, I'm working. Yes, like, yes, I'm working. hundred percent, hundred percent. There's no kind of break in between. Even if there yep. was just like three or four weeks between that one finishing and the next one starting, my prep, I'm still thinking about the next job. So, oh no, brain, absolutely, absolutely. I, my brain's working on it. So. I know. And more often than not, even though you're not on the payroll, they're contacting you constantly. Yeah. Oh, we know you're not on the payroll yet, but can you just do this? But can you just look at that? So yeah. it's true. It can be a never-ending train. That was something that we, when you were talking before about not going to meet with Ridley because you were on something and couldn't get out of it, I actually have I've, <laughs> I've started to kind of put some boundaries in place like that as well mm. with even when I was on my last project and my next project was wanting to talk to me about stuff and I just simply said, listen, we're not starting shooting on your situation for a while. Yeah. Can I not have these discussions until I finish yeah. this job? Yes. It's just the respect to this job that I'm currently on. I don't yes. have the bandwidth to be doing this and discussing my next one. And I'm sure when I'm on your job, you're not going to want me to be stretching exactly. myself out and talking about the next one. So, and exactly. they were actually, they took it really well because there was at one point I didn't hear from them for like two, three weeks. And then I got a, you know, a quick text message and she was just like, oh, I know I'm not supposed to be reaching out. I apologize. But just a very quick question. And it was just like, oh, wow. Okay. You took that on board yeah. and agreed with me and listened. It was awesome. <laughs> no, but quite rightly so because it's like, it's not even you. It's like respect people in the industry. Mm. You know, respect your peers. Mm. As you quite rightly say, you don't want me, oh, I'm not on set at the moment because I'm having a Zoom for my next job or yeah. I'm having a discussion about my next job. But it's, yeah. you know, it's, it is, it's, yeah. And is there a film that you remember watching at some point and just being blown away by the hair and or makeup? I think I found various films very interesting. I don't know if blown away, but like, wow, that's interesting. I mean, I remember seeing Amadeus years ago and thinking, wow, that looks really good, really stylish. Mm. How would you do that? Well, it's interesting because I've had a couple of directors, uh, you know, refer to Amadeus. It seems to pop up a bit. I think it was just such, I think, maybe it depends what age they are. Maybe it was at Mm. the stage you're at in your career, Mm. you think of. I mean, I have to say, I loved things like, I think, till the kind of 60s historical things where everyone actually just looks as if they've walked out of a 60s salon. They always, I always love those. They're they're really good. But I think there was one film, now, was it called Beaches? Yes, so I remember watching the beaches, and then after reading an article, and there was two aging makeups at the same time. I can't remember who the characters were. One had full prosthetics. That is a long time ago, so I don't want to be too critical, but it did look like a Ninja Turtle. And the other character, the female, was just looked amazing because I then read an article, they'd started off with prosthetics mm. and then peeled it away, peeled it away, and then sort of just done a bit of shading, a bit of this, a wig, and she acted it. And I thought, gosh, that's amazing. And, and to me, 
that's my kind of mantra. I'm there to aid and abate a performance, not to take it over, and it's not to be all about my makeup and hair. That's not yeah. what people have to watch. You're saying that they had this, the two different techniques in one film. Yeah, and there was still interesting because it was side by side. There were a couple in the film, and he mm. and it was made to be however many years later. Right. And he had the full works and sort of looked a bit sort of well, a bit unrecognisable. Well, she just you just believed that she was older, much older. Yeah. You know, there was age to be much older. And I thought, oh gosh, I met, do remember being very impressed by that. Now, in fairness, that's my taste. Yeah. I am much more less. I mean, I remember Jake's going, oh, no, we want more blood. Oh, no, we want more sweat. And I think, oh, it's a bit distasteful. It's too much as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's my taste. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's the right, but it's how I like. I like things a bit understated and things quite simple. So, but again, to people setting out your career, I think you have to get reach a stage as well where you think, well, that's what I think works, or I think that's, and I don't mean it in an arrogant way, but mm. to have some faith in your own taste and your own vision. Yeah. It will be changed if they don't like it. Like, I've had to throw tons of blood on people because that's what the director wants. Yeah. But I I had a kind of, not a oh, right, breakthrough is the wrong term. I had a kind of, oh, we made a revelation. Mm. I thought, I cannot do every hair and makeup for a film or a TV programme, whatever I was doing at the time, mm. and be wondering and worrying what other hair and makeup people are going to think when they see yeah. it. I've got to do it for me, for the production. If the actor's happy, mm. the director's happy, the producers are happy, I'm mm. happy. Yeah. And other people can sit and criticise, and that's mm. fine. That's their entitlement. But well, they're going to. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, and it's yeah, exactly. And, not everyone's yeah. going to think that it's no, exactly. Correct. But I so. think you need to sort of then, therefore, become a little bit more confident in your own, if not skills, I still kind of sometimes say, oh dear, that was a bit dodgy, but in your own taste and your own vision is maybe not right, but your own, well, your vision where you you want this look to be, etc. I think that's quite important. Mm. A bit sort of be true unto thyself. I yeah. think. I think. I don't know whether that's quoting the Bible or not. Might be quoting the Bible. <laughs> no idea, Graham. <laughs> I think it possibly could be from my religious upbringing as a child. <laughs> but no, it's it is true, and I have been in that position where I felt that it was overwhelming, and it was when I was doing Blonde and doing Marilyn, and mm. every time we had additionals coming in to help, I was beside myself. And I, no, I can understand. It was, I was yeah. just like, oh, my God, I don't want any of them to see her. They're all going to, in their mind, Pick be it. like, yeah. oh, I could do that better or that would, oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. And it's just like, Ugh. and it was just, yeah, it, <laughs> I had to get out of my own head because I was just no, like, no, no, I know, I know. It's just like as long as the actor's happy, the director's happy. Whatever. Yeah, and there was, <laughs> yeah, and look, the finished product, I know it's been a sort of contentious film from many points of view. But there was never any one criticism of, well, oh, she didn't look any like Marilyn. Was yeah, it? Yeah. Was not like, oh, that's unbelievable, et cetera. So, you know. I, I mean, you Even if it this. was, it's just everyone, as you say, we have our own opinions. And I have your own opinion. And, yeah. I mean, I would, that's what I say. I mean, I think, go, you know, like, take the hat off to you. I wouldn't have done it. I'd have just said, oh, no, I'm not doing that. Sorry, that's too <laughs> difficult. Everyone would be out to get me. Everyone would be. And also the thing I don't like about doing lookalikes is there used to be this, uh, the British people of a certain age might remember it. What was it called again? Anyway, it was basically, it was a host and you would come onto the show and what was it, changing faces? Was it or, the, hang on a minute. It was, it, and they would normally be a musical person. Yeah, and they'd go, and tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be Judy yeah. Garland. <laughs> and then they'd go through a kind of smoking arch and then come back to you all done up and made yeah, up. Yeah, I used to watch that. They had it down and, in New uh, Zealand. I can't I'm remember I'm trying to called. remember what it was called. But that's <laughs> the was only thing I was saying. <laughs> oh, very entertaining. I just always say, any, the minute anyone phones about looking like he's, I think, oh, no, it's <laughs> Just like, gosh, the night, Matthew. <laughs> Tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be such and such. Of <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, question I ask everybody what one tool or product would you never want to be without? One tool or product I would never want to be without. What's your I go to? Would, uh, my go to, I've got a favorite little bristle brush mm-hmm. for here yeah. that. I don't know where I got it. I've had it for years and years and years. You can't really get them now. I think it's real bristle Mm. uh, with a kind of 
pointy end but not a tail comb end. I love it for everything. And makeup wise... I, this, people are going to be horrified, but I always have a cream puff in my kit somewhere. A nouveau beige, if they still do it. A bit of old cr- cream puff has got me out of a few tricky corners. Bald heads. A, hang on a minute. What? A, what? a cream puff is a, is a, a pressed powder base. It's Max Factor. It's Max ah, Factor. Right, right, they've right. made it since, they've made it since like, I think they've made it since the 40s. And you can wet it and use it like a base. It does then you look as if you've been embalmed. But right. that's where the style used to be. But that's one product I always have. It's a, a Max Factor. I think we still do the new Rouge Beige. Okay. It shows you how long since I bought it. It's just one of these things that if you suddenly get a really bold, shiny head that you can't get rid of, it gets rid of it. If suddenly yeah, you've quickly. got a hideous spot, you can somehow just with this cream powder, it's like a powdery, it's not cream, you can suddenly cover that spot, etc. Yeah. So I've always, it's one of those things I've had in my kit since I started, because it was all Max Factor we used to the BBC, yeah. in the most hideous colours, it has to be said. <laughs> Would you, do you want to look like chamomile lotion today? I have the colour for you. <laughs> or do you want to look as if you've been sprayed with orange paint? I have the colour for you here. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and what one person would you like to hear on the podcast? Now, I am going to say something which I know is a bit of a get out, cop out, get out. I would love someone like Max Factor who brought so many innovations in makeup to yeah. the industry. Oh, yeah. It'd be interesting to hear. I think he was Hungarian, is he? And I think, I think he ran a pharmacy shop opposite the early studios like this is like 1914 or something and mm. all the makeup all the people kept coming out just wanting bits of makeup and he started to make makeup and I think he'd had it he had a training in makeup but whatever he was like he invented the cream puff I think he developed and invented block mascara I mean there's tons of things that Max Factor was the, the originator of in makeup so someone like him but there was a whole dynasty of them. And then there's the Westmores as well, of course, they were a whole family day. I think there's still some of them working, in fact. Yeah. So somebody like that would be interesting, I think. Other people in the industry, no, because I'd just be jealous. Oh, why are they being interviewed <laughs> and I'm not? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, that's what they think. Oh, I think differently. <laughs> you know. But yes, I think someone like Max Factor would be interesting. Current people, I can't really think. That's all right. Your answer was great. Yeah, no, I think it would be fascinating to talk about so that. Yeah. yeah. And um, before we wrap, would you be okay to do a quick fire round of questions in 30 seconds, Graham? I'll try my best. Okay, so you ready? Right. Would you rather work on location or on stage? Location. Would you rather work in snow or sand? Snow. If you won Lotto, would you keep working? Yes. Do you watch more TV or movies? Movies. Have you ever quit a job? No. Have you ever been fired? No. Yet. Do you believe in aliens? No. (laughs) No. (laughs) No. I've met a few aliens, but I don't believe in them. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, this has been such a pleasure, Graham, and I'm so glad I could talk you into it. So, oh, thank you. No, thank you, Jim. I've really enjoyed it. It's been really good fun. Okay, Last Looks crew, thanks for listening. And remember, if you love it, share it. A quick scroll down and you'll find our show notes. Or maybe you'd like to give your support and leave a five-star review. Come on, I know you want to. Search The Last Looks podcast on Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok, whichever one tickles your fancy. And a massive shout out to the husband, Brett Stanley. Without his patience and tech support, this whole podcast situation simply does not happen and cheers to Liliana Rose for her fabulous voice acting talents okay last looks crew that's a wrap for me I don't need to be told twice to get out of here so bye I'll catch you on the flip side that's a wrap people